Hello, Georgian, and welcome to Conversation on Big Cats. I'm so delighted that you're here. It's just so important to um, share with people the view of one of the greatest zoos um, that we have and all of the fantastic work that you are doing for the conservation of not just big cats, but so many species across the board. Um, please share with us a little of your work so much of your exciting life and tell us the journey that you've been on all of these days and how the zoo is helping with conservation. Thank you first of all for having me here and I'm really excited to be here and share some of our zoo stories and some of my stories and I have been with the zoo for 42 years that's a very long time so I could talk to you for five days straight but I'll try to keep it short i'll just give you some snippets of information tonight so let me get my presentation up and we'll go from there so the title of my presentation is san diego zoo global the roar a symbol of hope and san diego zoo global is our parent organization and the organization runs the san diego zoo the san diego zoo safari park and our institute for conservation research i'm going to tell you a little bit about our organization and then tell you a little bit about what i am doing with the organization so this is the main entrance of the zoo and if you'll note there is this gigantic big cat statue there that is rex the lion and he's 20 feet high and weighs 27,000 pounds so you might be wondering why is there this magnificent lion at the entrance of the San Diego Zoo. So I want to tell you a little story. And it all started with the Panama Canal, which was finished in uh, 1914. And of course, it was one of the world's greatest engineering feats connecting the Atlantic Ocean with the Pacific Ocean. And here you can see a shot of the Panama Canal. And San Diego was the first port of call in the United States on the western coast. And so our city decided to have this World's Fair to try to build the economy of this tiny city of 40,000 people and, and draw attention to us being the first port of call. So we had the Panama California Exposition, which was a World's Fair. And at this exposition, there were collections of animals dotted throughout the park. They were like there were some lions, there were wolves, there were coyotes, and you can see they were really old fashioned cages. And this is a, a different view. So if you look kind of in the first third of the picture, you can see the cages lining one of the streets. And the current zoo today would be down in the bottom of the screen where you see the um, shadow of the, of the blimp. So one day, a local physician, it was September 26, 1916 to be exact, was driving down the street after performing surgery and the, he heard the roar of Rex the lion. This is Rex the lion in this cage. And he was riding with his brother and he turned to his brother and he said, wouldn't it be splendid if San Diego had a zoo? You know, I think I'll start one. And so he drove to the newspaper, and the next day, this story ran in the newspaper that said Dr. Harry Wegaforth was planning to create a zoo in San Diego with these leftover animals from the exposition. So on October 2nd, 1916, the San Diego Zoo was born. And the community thought this man was a fool. They thought, how can this man think he's going to build a world-renowned zoo in this tiny city? He is crazy. But Dr. Harry had this vision, and he was determined, and he was tenacious and enthusiastic. And by 1924, what had been a source of amusement for the city of San Diego had become a source of pride because at that point, in only you know eight short years, we had created one of the finest zoos in the world. And we like to say that it began with a roar. San Diego Zoo began with a roar. And since we were founded, now we're more than 100 years old, we have been continuing that roar. And I tell the story because had it not been for Rex the Lion roaring and Dr. Harry being inspired by that roar, 
we might not ever have had a San Diego Zoo. And I think when you look at the big cats in the world, they are, they are very inspiring to people and, and they are symbols of conservation. And so I, we like to share our founding story because I think it says a lot about who we are and what, what we were doing. And now I would like to share a video that shows how far we have come and it, it'll just give you a feel for the San Diego Zoo and Safari Park and the work that we are doing. So let me get this video started. Here we go. And the video was created to celebrate our anniversary and to raise a lot of money for our organization, to raise half a billion dollars for conservation. And now I'll be quiet and let you watch it. Imagine a place which for over a century has transformed into an exhilarating and vibrant natural haven where people can see the beauty and majesty of animals thriving in naturalistic environments, where people of all ages come together to see things they could not see anywhere else, to feel things never felt before. Imagine a place where connections are made between animals and people every day, every hour, every minute. A place of innovation, inspiration and passion where the future looks promising and where joy and hope reign free imagine a place that has become a vital part of so many lives a place that feels like home a place where memories are made that will last a lifetime this place is the San Diego Zoo a place that celebrates life and all living things. And this place thrives because of you. Life happens here. Life begins here. Life is nurtured here. Life grows here. Life thrives here. Life plays here. Life learns here. Life is cherished here. Life has meaning here. Life is saved here. Life is protected here. Life has hope here. We are here because of you. You help us ensure that life continues to thrive here and throughout the world. We need you to help ignite a passion for wildlife within every child, to grow our worldwide leadership in animal and plant care and inspirational experiences, and to save critically endangered species for future generations. Join us as we roar forward into the next 100 years and help shape the future of your San Diego Zoo Global. Life happens here.
wine is so special to our organization. And about six or seven years ago, we changed our vision for the organization and the vision changed to lead the fight against extinction. And we wanted to be considered a conservation organization that just happens to run two zoos, the San Diego Zoo and the San Diego Zoo Safari Park. And our headquarters for our conservation work is the Beckman Center for Conservation Research. And we have a lot of different divisions doing work all over the zoo. We've got, you know, eight major areas plus what we call our frozen zoo. And the frozen zoo is, uh, there's nothing like it in the world. It's a cell bank, cells stored in nitrogen. We've got 10,000 individual animals represented, everything from cell cultures to sperm to eggs, including extinct species in this frozen zoo. And when we first started it back in 1975, we didn't know why we were saving all of these cells of animals. And now there are many projects that we're able to use them for and, and possibly save a lot of animals from extinction with our frozen zoo. But what a lot of people don't realize is that we do conservation work all over the world. Um, as you can see by the map, we are uh, in 100, uh, 140 projects on six continents, and we have more than 300 conservation partners. Uh, I'm, I'm proud to say that we work with Wildlife SOS in India, and we're in many, many other places in the world. But I'd like to just mention three different areas where we do some big cat work. One is Kochakashu, which is a conservation and research center in Manu National Park in Peru. It's a very, very remote area. I haven't even been there. It takes two or three days, like boats and all to get there. But we work with several different organizations. Um, one of the animals that we are studying there are jaguars. And we also teach young students when I say young, college age students, how to become conservation biologists. So it's not just an area where we are studying animals and working to save habitat, but it's also a training center, a resource center for students of conservation biology. We are also working in Sumatra. Uh, we partner with the Wildlife Conservation Society, which is actually the Bronx Zoo in New York. We work with um, Rhinos International. Uh, International Rhino Foundation, I mean, and so we're working in southern Sumatra and we're studying tigers there and, and trying to learn what their habits are, where they go, the ecology of tigers, and we're using that to help the local communities plan conservation plans for tigers. We also, like I said, work with the communities. We've helped them build tiger-proof pens for their livestock. We've funded anti-poaching patrols. So this is another area where we are working, not just with tigers, but with all the other animals, Sumatran rhinos, elephants that live in the area there. And then we also have a very extensive Northern Kenya program. And I have a video that I'd like to show you um, that was created in 2017. And since then our program has really grown. Uh, but let me show you this video first. And then I'll tell you a little bit more what we do there. What I found in my whole conservation career is that there are many like-minded people in the world and we're all positioned in a different role in that. And I met Carmi, must be 10, 12, at least 10 or 12, maybe 15 years ago. I've always kept a very close connection with Carmi because I've had a, such a high respect for San Diego for how it does business, for what it means for conservation, and for the opportunity of you sharing our message. And also your appetite for risk. When we started the Northern Rangers Trust, uh, Westgate Conservancy uh, was a pipe dream. Uh, there was no grass, there was no wildlife, everything had been killed. The community had total contempt for the national park. It was a big negative. Uh, San Diego stepped into the ring with us. Uh, they funded it now for 11 years. They've enabled that conservancy to be one of the leading conservancies within the uh, NRT. It has a high-end lodge, self-sustaining, uh, partially self-sustaining from tourism. There's nil poaching there.
for me, as a pastoral kid, I, I, I was lucky enough to have been born and brought up in this humble background, where as I do herding of livestock before I went to school, I used to interact with this wildlife species. I used to, you know, see gravies out in the wild, and they were my companions as I go out herding. So I never used to feel lonely just because I had giraffes, I had gravies all around me. But because of this decline in number, my partner who are gravies, the giraffe, I'm, I've seen them decline in numbers over time. So we have expanded our work in Kenya. We are doing leopard research, giraffe research. We support elephant uh, orphanages. Uh, we work with the local communities. We vaccinate their livestock. But those beautiful women you just heard singing, I don't know if you know what they said, but they were singing Awasu Mama Simba. And what the Mama Simba program is, it started in 2013 with Awasu Lion Conservation Group, and we worked with them. And the whole idea of the program was to engage the local women in conservation activities. And before that, it was really the men who were doing most of the conservation work. So we started working with the women and showing them how to track lions and take data. And they even went and would pick up trash on the reserve. Um, but they would participate in conservation training and, and actually help with a lot of the conservation work on behalf of lions. And in return, we sent a lot of the women to school and we helped teach them skills so they could improve their economics. Um, and, and, and make money to support themselves. But what is amazing to me are the results of this program. And I've, I've got a couple quotes from some of the women, the Samburu women who participated. So listen to this. And this just shows how important it is to involve local communities in conservation work that you were doing and build capacity for them. I have changed as a result of the Mama Simba program. I now cannot accept people to kill lions. Another quote from another woman, another um, Samburu. Since joining the program, I have learned to love lions unlike before. And what I think is important about this is it gives you hope. When you see, I, I know there's a, a lot of negative things happening in the conservation work but there also are a lot of good things in the conservation world and when you see programs like this when you see attitudes changing when you see the local people really caring and embracing conservation and saving animals in their area it gives me hope and it gives me hope for a much brighter future so uh, i feel that the mama simba program is very symbolic of the work that we can do if we work together with local communities. Now I'd like to switch gears a little bit and, and talk to you a little bit about my role at the zoo because I am not a scientist. I My background is journalism and uh, a lot of people, my name is George Ann Irvine, but a lot of people call me George from the zoo or George the zoo lady. And I grew up in San Diego. I was born in San Diego and I grew up going to the San Diego Zoo. So that's me, that's little Georgie petting a sheep in the petting paddock at the zoo, and those are my sister's skinny legs behind me. And here I am, there I am, little Georgie again with a striped shirt in the middle at the children's zoo, which by the way, we've torn it down and we're building a brand new children's zoo at San Diego. But as a child, I was very curious. And I wanted to know everything, and I didn't want to miss anything. So the next picture kind of shows you about my inquisitiveness. And I, I remember when this picture was taken, 
So there I am. I didn't want to miss anything, as I said. So there I am looking in a trash can because I think something interesting might be in it. I can remember looking in the storm drains and the gutters. And anyway, I think this was um, probably a symbol of what was to come for me because I am very curious and, and that helps me with the writing that I do. And I studied journalism. I got my degree in journalism at San Diego State University. And I like to joke that when I was in high school, I had this dream that I wanted to be a Broadway star. You know, I wanted to be in a show on Broadway, but the problem was I couldn't sing and I couldn't dance. So there you go. And so I went into journalism instead. And I actually was a pretty good writer and I liked writing. And so my journalism degree set the stage for my career with the San Diego Zoo. There I am. I mean, heaven forbid the koala gets uh, rain on it. There I am holding the umbrella. But my first 22 and a half years at the zoo were in public relations and marketing. So for me, I wasn't a scientist, but I was able to tell the scientist stories. I was able to tell the story of what the zoo was doing to people, help teach them why it's important to protect and save animals. And I would book animals, and we had a very famous person who worked for us at the time. I would book her for television shows, which helped get her messaging out, and I would help take the animals up to the television shows. And I was a media spokesperson. I wrote press releases. I worked with our marketing division and created television commercials. I worked with film crews. So everything I did in those 22 and a half years in public relation and marketing was to help share our message with the world and with the community. And I learned a lot when I started at the zoo, I thought that it just sounded like it would be fun. I mean, why wouldn't it be fun? I'd be working at the zoo and working with animals, but I, I had only been there a month or so when I learned the importance of what we were doing. And even back then in 1978, I, I saw that animals were losing habitats, poachings, poachers were killing animals, rainforests were being built down, and I realized the importance, uh, the work that our zoo was doing, and I realized that, that my job as a communicator was very, very important. But also in those 22 and a half years, I learned to love clouded leopards. Batika, I know that you have photographed them in the wild, and my dream would be to see a clouded leopard in the wild, but we had this little clouded leopard named Tui San who was an animal ambassador. And I'd never even heard of a clouded leopard. And the minute I met him, I loved him. And I remember we took him up to Los Angeles for a television show and I had to spend the night in a hotel room with him. And of course, I'm allergic to cats, but it doesn't matter. I mean, heaven forbid, it was so exciting to be in this hotel room. But what was really funny is he needed to exercise. So the way he exercised, and he was about six months old, was chasing us around the room and ripping the curtains off the wall. So even though he was an animal ambassador, he was still a wild cat. And of course, you would never, ever want to have a wild cat as a pet. But he was an animal ambassador with an animal trainer, and we were able to introduce people to clouded leopards. I also fell in love with cheetahs when I was at in public relations and I have a story a little bit later about one of our cheetah ambassadors and I also fell in love with tigers and nowadays we don't do quite what we did back then in the 1980s late 1970s but this is me in a hotel room with a tiger cub whose mother had rejected it so until it got to be about eight months old, we were able to use it as an ambassador to show people how magnificent tigers are. And we had taken it up to Los Angeles to a television show and it started yowling in the middle of the night. So the trainer was sound asleep. So I got up and I played with him a little bit and turned on the television for him. But, but in my PR days at the zoo, I really learned to appreciate big cats and all animals as a matter of fact. And then my next career at the zoo, because I've had three careers there, was in development communications, that's fundraising communications. So my job was to create all of the materials from videos to brochures to magazines that 
our organization needed to raise $60 million a year to build new exhibits and for conservation efforts. And when people say, why do you love your job at the zoo? I, I like to show this photo. This is one of our cheetah ambassadors. And the reason the cheetah was in my office was because we were launching a new website. And so we were getting photos of the cheetah by the cheetah and the website and all, but our photographer happened to snap that photo of me. And you can just see by the look on my face how excited I am. But one of the projects I helped create materials um, for was our tiger exhibit at our safari park. And it's called Tiger Trail. And these are some of the uh, printed materials that we created. But I also created a video, which I'm about to show you. And I was interviewing our tiger keeper for the video. And she got very emotional and started crying because tigers and, and tiger conservation was so important to her. And she started apologizing to me. And I said, no, no, don't apologize. This is great because it shows how much you care and your emotions are really important in helping tell the story. So I'm gonna share this video with you and, and I think um, you'll see Tina, our caretaker, get a little bit emotional, but I, I felt that it was really important for her to do that because her, her words were coming from her heart. Oh, hold on, let me. So here we go with, this is my last video of the evening. Tigers are important in the world because they are part of a greater system. They're the top predators and without them, you don't have the rest of the ecosystem. Very important to the survival of everything in that part of the world. It's special being a tiger keeper because it's something I've always wanted to do. They're beautiful animals. You know, it's something you learn from the very beginning when you're very, very little. It's one of the first animals you learn about. When you're learning about stripes and spots, tigers is the first thing that you're taught about with stripes. Everybody knows what a tiger is. It's a, it's a wonderful animal to work with. I never really think about how great it is to go in with tiger cubs, but when you're in there, I just always just sitting there going, I have the coolest job in the world. When you look at how tigers are being pressured in many of the areas in which you see them, by encroachment of habitat, by loss of habitat, illegal logging, um, so many people coming into their ranges, the pressure that is placed on these animals, and then when you add in poaching, these, these unfortunate creatures have gone from tens of thousands to, there's only about 32 to 3,400 tigers of all four subspecies or species left in the entire world. Only less than 300 Sumatran tigers. I feel like they motivate me to give back. However capacity it may be, giving back to tigers, giving back to their native land, giving back to other animals, it doesn't matter. I give back, I'm much more generous because of them. They make me want to, um, to save them. And even though that may be hard to do, um, I think that it's very important that we try. I still get teary when I see Tina, Tina cry. Um, so we were able to raise the money, um, built the most magnificent tiger habitat, and it's very spacious, and, and we don't go in with our tigers. Um, you saw them cuddling the cubs because they had needed to, to weigh them, but we want our tiger mothers, we want all of our animal mothers to raise their own cubs. Uh, we only hand rear them if the mother rejects the animals. But uh, one particular donor gave us $9 million to, so I guess the video and the materials work, but, but again, when we do raise money for our exhibits, a lot of the money also goes to support our conservation work. So that was one of my projects in the fundraising division. And while I was in PR and marketing and in development, I wrote 
books on the side. I freelance books primarily, well, actually all about animals. And so that takes us to my third career at the San Diego Zoo. But before that, I would like to tell you that I have become very passionate about seeing animals in the wild. I travel to as many wild places as I can to photograph the animals. I feel that that enables me to tell their story better, to help you know be a champion of conservation. So I wanted to tell you two stories about encounters with big cats that, that really mean a lot to me. And this was taken in, you know, my favorite place to go on safari, believe it or not, a lot of people will say, Africa? No, my favorite place to go on safari is in India. And Kazaranga National Park is probably one of my favorite places on earth. And I was there in um, 20, 2018, and you can just see by the look on my face how happy I am seeing this greater one-horned rhino just, you know, grazing by the side of the river. Uh, just that to me is pure bliss, pure happiness. So my first trip to India was in 2005. And I've been there many, many, many times since there, but this was my very first time, my very first national park. It was Bronfenbohr National Park. And we had been told you might not see a tiger, don't expect it. So we had seen, you know, the jackals and the black-faced langers and spotted deer and peacocks. And I was really happy. I was very excited, but I did want to hear, see a tiger. So all of a sudden, the forest burst into alarm calls of animals. It was like a symphony of sounds. I had never heard anything like this in my life, ever, ever, ever. And so our, our driver took us to where the sound was and there about a hundred yards from our vehicle was this magnificent tiger. This is the tiger. And it was so beautiful. And I just couldn't believe I was seeing a tiger in the wild. So all of a sudden the tiger gets up and it starts walking toward us. And I thought, oh my gosh, I mean, it's getting closer and closer. And it was, it was getting closer and closer. And then there it was. And luckily I had my short lens on my camera and I snapped this photo. To this day, I have never had such a magnificent tiger sighting. This is my best ever tiger picture. It's my pretty much first tiger picture, but it kept walking. It kept getting closer. And I thought, oh my gosh, it's gonna jump in our vehicle. And of course it wasn't gonna jump in the vehicle, but I was just so excited my heart was pounding. And then our driver backed up and it passed in front of us. And there was a, a bus of people in front of us and we were in a car, but it just passed in front of us, looked at the people, and just went off into the forest. It, it didn't really care that we were there, but to have that first tiger sighting, to be so magnificent, it just sealed the deal for me. I mean, tigers are one of my absolute favorite animals in the world, and that moment is one that I, that was in 2005, as I said, and I still remember it as vividly as if it were yesterday. So that was just such a magnificent experience, and I love to, share that story and the other story i would like to share about a, a big cat encounter was in the serengeti in tanzania uh in january of 2019 and there were five vehicles on the road and our guide was looking at that tree you see there with binoculars and i didn't really know what was happening because they weren't telling us what was happening and all of a sudden the driver says get your camera ready and i'm thinking okay and I didn't know this at the time that they were not supposed to do this until this was all over. But all of a sudden the vehicles turn and they are drag racing to this tree. Uh, in the Serengeti, you are not supposed to go off road. Again, I didn't know that and, until we got back on the road again. So they race to the tree and he says, you're gonna have a minute at this tree. And so I had two cameras, a long lens and a short lens. He puts us under the tree, and this is what we see, a leopard up in the tree. I am so focused on the leopard, I'm, I'm nervous because I have a minute, 
and I'm trying to get its eyes in focus and I have my long lens and I'm just looking at that leopard's eyes. I'm just staring at the leopard. I'm really not looking what's around the leopard. And normally I'm pretty observant, but I was just focused on the leopard. So right as we were about to leave, I took my wide lens camera. I again looked at the leopard in the eyes and I shot like 10 photos. So when I got home and was processing my photos, this is what I found. Look at that. There is a full grown male impala up in the tree next to the leopard. And I had been so engrossed in the leopard's eyes that I didn't see that. And that's huge. How do you miss that? So I called one of the people who'd been on the vehicle with me, you know, when we got home and I said, Oh my God, Carolyn, did you see that impala in the tree? Was it? And she said, no, she hadn't seen it either. So it was like such a surprise to see this huge animal that this leopard had dragged up there and I had not even noticed it when I was there. And I'm embarrassed to say that because I am normally more observant, but it was still a magical experience. And it was just such a surprise for me when I got home to see that up in the tree. And it just is another favorite, favorite big cat encounter that I will always treasure. I still don't know. Leopards are so strong. I mean, how did it get that huge impala up there? But it did. Pretty amazing. And now this brings me to my third career with San Diego Zoo, and that is as Director of Corporate Publishing. Our CEO a few years ago felt that hey, we've got a television show, we've got an online presence, social media, we've got magazines, but we need to take it, a, take it a step further. We need to start a book publishing division. And so he asked if I would create this book publishing division, San Diego Zoo Global Press. And when you think about it, we do have a wealth of stories from aardvark to zebra. Uh, we're 104 years old, and so... The whole goal of creating these books was to inspire a passion um, in wildlife and conservation for children and adults through books. And we're new, we're not National Geographic. These are some of the books that we have already published and we have many, many more books in the works. So we've got books for children. Um, the Pangolin book will be out in the next month or so and that's really exciting because we deal with the issues facing pangolins today and and um you know that they're the most widely trafficked mammal in the world but then what's nearest and dearest to my heart i have to say are the books that i am writing myself and it's our hope and inspiration collection and these are true animal stories about individual animals that have overcome challenges in their lives and when I when we were creating the series I felt that if a child could identify with a specific animal with Karen the orangutan or Floyd the flamingo the child would then be more likely to identify with that animal's species and animals in general and that it would inspire them to care about wildlife in the natural world and that is what has happened with these books but what has also happened is that the children have learned life lessons because they identify with these particular animals and these animals go through these challenges in their lives and the kids identify with that more than they identify with people and so these are some of the books that are currently out and i'm really really proud to say that we've won some national awards with the books and they're all illustrated with photos they're geared for about age five to 10, but adults like them too. The, the, they're, you know, they're not written in baby language. I mean, I've had a lot of adults read the books and they really enjoy them. And we also have created plush animals to go with the book so the child can sit in bed and read the book and snuggle their Floyd Flamingo. But there are two of the stories I would like to share with you, and I know we're running low on time, so I'll do quick versions of these stories, but I think it's really important to share these with you. And the first is a book that will be out this fall, and it's called Saving Mocha, The True Tale of a, of a Rescued Tiger Cub. And this is a true story, and this is another story where we're able to address wildlife trafficking. 
Oka was a tiger cub that was born in, in Mexico and it was being smuggled over the border into San Diego County. And the vehicle stopped at the border and the border patrol officer asked the guy, what is that on the floor of your car? And he said, it's a house cat that I'm taking to my girlfriend. And the officer looked and when it yawned, he thought that is not a house cat, that's a tiger. So this poor little tiger who had been taken from its mother at a very young age was being illegally smuggled into the US to probably be sold as a pet, which is a horrible thing to happen to a tiger. So he was brought to our safari park and we did a DNA analysis and he was not a purebred. He was part Bengal, part um, Amur tiger, Malayan and Sumatran. So we knew he wouldn't be able to go into a tiger breeding program, but we knew that he would eventually have a, a life in a wildlife sanctuary, which is better than, than most tigers that are smuggled into our country. So we were going to raise him until it was time for him to move the sanctuary. But there was a tiger in uh, Washington, D.C. A mother tiger was raising her cub, a Sumatran tiger, and all of a sudden she got very aggressive to the cub and they were afraid that she would injure that cub. So they had to pull it and decided to send it to San Diego Zoo Safari Park so he could be raised with Mocha and they could grow up together as tigers. And what was really important was Rakan, the little tiger from um, National Zoo, had been raised by his mother for a short time. So he had more of the wild instincts and we felt that he would be able to teach Mocha, the little confiscated tiger cub, how to be a tiger. So they became very famous and the story is about them growing up together and, and learning to be tigers. And then Mocha got very sick and he actually almost died. He had a lot of medical problems, which we think is because he was pulled from his mother so early and probably because he was inbred. And we feel that if he were not under our care, he most likely would have died. So really Mocha is one of the lucky tigers. And we were able to save his life. He had a big ball of milk in his stomach, which had moved up almost to his lungs through a hole in his diaper. I mean, he really had kind of a, a lot of problems with his insides that we were able to fix with surgery. You can see in one of the photos that we're putting him in a, a CT scanner to see what's wrong with him. And then um, once they were about a year old, we separated them. Rakan is now a part of our uh, Sumatran Tiger breeding program. And Mocha has gone on to a wonderful wildlife sanctuary and has a little female friend. They're not breeding, uh, they've both been fixed, but so that he does have a, a friend for life, uh, Nola, a little white tiger. And I think the story is inspirational in that we were able to save Mocha's life, but we're also to illustrate the evils of wildlife trafficking and how it's not good for tigers, how tigers should not be pets. And we're really glad that kids will learn about the importance of fighting wildlife trafficking through Mocha's story. So that's, that's one of our new books that's coming out and we have tiger facts in the back. We also have another section, a map on where tigers live in the wild and, and threats facing tigers and things that kids can do to help save tigers and other animals. I mean, concrete things, you know, we give them action steps that they can do in the back of the book. So that's one of our hope and inspiration books. And I'd like to end with this story. And I'll tell you why. In, in this world we're in right now with with civil unrest and COVID-19 and, and global warming and the Amazon being destroyed at a, a more rapid rate than ever and, and poaching. This is a story about hope and friendship and miracles. And I think it's an important story because all of us I know are really working to save animals. I'm working to share their stories and you know, we're defeated a lot, but we can never give up. And that's what this story symbolizes. And it's called Rooks and Raina. And like I said, it's a story about friendship and miracles. And Rooks was a little cheetah whose mother rejected him. So he was brought to the safari park to become an animal ambassador. And we have found that when we pair a cheetah with a dog, we are able to use it for education programs 
and really wow people and and educate them about the plight of cheetahs and how important it is to save them. And so we paired him with Raina. His name is Ruxa, this little uh, Rhodesian Ridgeback. And they became best buddies. And even though Raina was twice his size when they were little, he was still the boss and jumped on her head. And they learned to walk on leashes. And we always emphasize they don't make good pets. These are specially trained animals. You know, we're just using them for education purposes. And so Rooksa had a problem with his legs. They started to grow crooked and we thought he would outgrow it, but he didn't. And so he ended up having to have surgery to fix his legs. And Raina stayed by his side during the surgery and she was there for his recovery. And our veterinarians felt that Rooksa would probably be able to walk but he probably would not be able to run. But nobody told Rooks of that. And so he started to run anyway. So it's amazing when you don't know what you can't do, you do it anyway. So this was miracle number one that Rooksa, even though we never thought he'd be able to run, was able to run and became one of our fastest cheetahs. So he and Raina grew up became quite well known as animal ambassadors. They went through walks at our safari park, and then they did what we call cheetah run. And it's pretty cool because the cheetah chases a lure and you can see it get up to 70 miles an hour in two seconds. And of course we know that they only run that for a short distance, but Ruxa, the cheetah who we never thought would run, is now running 70 miles an hour and Raina it's pretty fast, faster than I can run, but it's only like 27 miles an hour. And there they are, grown up, handsome, beautiful. Here they are as little cubs. And um, so we think things are going really well when all of a sudden Raina starts to limp. And we think she has a problem with her foot, but we look and it turns out she does not have a problem with her foot. She has a shoulder problem. In fact, she has three cancerous tumors in her shoulder and it's terminal cancer it's a cancer of the blood vessels there is no treatment so all of a sudden Raina has weeks maybe months but probably weeks to live and Ruxa and Raina are best friends and we are worried what is this cheetah going to do without his best friend so we brought in little Ray another Rhodesian Ridgeback and we felt that Little Ray would be there to keep Raina the dog's spirits up while she was ill and dying and that she could become a friend to Ruxa when we lost our beloved Raina. And so here you see Little Ray meeting Raina and they bonded right away, but Ruxa didn't like Little Ray very well. He wasn't very friendly toward her and we kind of think it's because he already had a best friend who was a dog and why did he need this little puppy who was jumping all over the place but they still would play together that's that's Rooks and little Ray running so the strangest thing happened Raina didn't seem sick anymore and this is a dog that's been given weeks maybe months to live but so she doesn't seem sick though so what is what is happening so we took her to the vet and the strangest thing happened, two of the tumors, this is terminal cancer, two of the terminal, two of the tumors had totally disappeared and one had shrunk enough that we were able to do surgery. And this is with no treatment. We don't really know what happened. It really is a miracle. So we were able to remove the big tumor in Raina and we were overjoyed because we thought now maybe she does have a chance to survive and she went through three rounds of chemotherapy and i actually went with her to one of those rounds of chemotherapy and she was the best patient she just laid there on the table with her her trainer kristen cuddling her and you know i think she knew that she was being helped and so after three rounds of chemotherapy a few months later Raina was declared cancer-free and the duo became a trio. I mean, a miracle indeed. Miracle, Ruxa learned to run, 
and Raina survived terminal cancer. And I'd like to leave you with one thought that, that when you think about it, once you choose hope, anything is possible. So for all of us who are fighting to save the big cats of the world, the habitats of the world, all the other animals in this world, on this planet, we have to have hope. And I think once we choose that, I really believe that anything is possible and that we can make a difference for wildlife all over the world and we just have to work together. So thank you so much for listening to my tales and I will share a few websites for you in case you'd like to learn a little bit more about the San Diego Zoo and the work that we do. And thank you for being interested in conservation of big cats and conservation of animals in general. Thank you so much. Thanks, Georgian. I always cry when I hear that story. And I've still got tears in my eyes. So <laughs> I know what it's like. Um, I have to tell you that the first time I saw Cheetah in the wild, um, there was a mother and there was little cubs, little tiny things. And uh, my father remembers that I sat and cried. I cried all over my camera. I kept taking pictures, but I kept crying. I just cried and cried and cried. So I know what it's like. And, um, you know, I, I know what these bonds are like and how special they can be. Um, we must plan your um, clouded leopard trip. Um, there's two or three sites where I've heard um, you can see clouded leopards. We'll have to do a longish trip, but we'll work on it. I think we have time now to plan it because um, travel, I think, really is is realistically possible only next year now. Um, once a vaccine yeah. kicks in and, and everything becomes um, possible. So we'll take up this conversation and hopefully we'll see a clouded leopard together. I would love that. And in fact, I was supposed to go on my dream trip to guess where? Brazil in August to see jaguars in the wild in the Pantanal. And um, I guess I'm not going there anymore, but I, I'd like to go there again too. But yes, to go see clouded leopards. You've seen snow leopards. You've seen all of the cats in the world and photography is so beautiful you are just such an inspiration yeah. um and and you know when i think about the photos that you take and the photos that i try to take and other photographers when people see these pictures we are bringing this story these beautiful wild animals into their homes and into their hearts and so i know that you are also a scientist and you have done so much conservation work, but I think now with your incredible photography efforts, but now you're on a whole new mission. In addition to the conservation work, you're really sharing the stories of animals with the world. And, and it's, it's really important that we have people to think that. Thank you, Georgian, and so good to talk to you. Thank you for doing this. Um, it'll, it'll really be so special for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Stay safe. Stay well. Okay, you too. Bye. See you next year. Bye. 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 system of wildlife administration of the conservation management system.